This now is going to be the, which we, we've sort of finished everything we wanted to do, talking about uh, transactions and concurrent control in the context of multi-versioning. Um, so now we want to spend time talking about data structures we need to have and how this fits into the overall system and, and how we can do transactions on top of this. So there'll be sort of three lectures on indexing. So today's class will be a uh, sort of an overview of, ex of a traditional existing techniques to do locking and latching in, in indexes. And then on Wednesday, you guys will be reading the paper we wrote here or last year on the a, a lat tree or lock free index, the BW tree, which is the default index in our new database system. And then on Monday next week, we'll see uh, how uh, an alternative to doing uh, the sort of the key base indexes that we're talking about here and on Monday of how to use like radix trees or tries to do more efficient order preserving indexes. The main takeaway that I guess the spoiler would be, and you'll see this when you read the paper, is that I was super uh, enthusiastic about building a BW tree here at, at Carnegie Mellon. We ended up building one and turned out the and that paper you're going to read says why it sucks. So let's jump right into this. All right, so today's agenda is really, again, like a high level overview about concurrency control mechanisms we need. PowerPoint crashed. Hold up. Give it a sec. Give it a sec. All right, sorry. All right. Um, the uh, I didn't even say it. yeah. Today's agenda. So today is going to an overview of concurrency control methods we need in in context of transactions or sorry in, in indexes, and it'll be a combination of understanding how do we make our our indexes thread safe and how do we make sure that our transactions see the correct information. So we'll talk about the difference between index latches and locks and latches. We'll talk about how do you actually implement a latch. And then we'll talk about uh, the logical and physical techniques to protect the, the indexes using a combination of these things. So I should go, with, should go without saying, we don't need to describe an index here, but just to, again, to, to remind ourselves is that the, the database indexes that we're talking about for this class and going forward are these data structures that the database system is going to maintain that are going to allow it to uh, speed up the execution of queries that need to retrieve uh, data. And we're primarily going to be focusing on uh, OTP indexes, so how do we make our transactions run faster. There are indexes to speed up analytical queries, but in practice, oftentimes, if, it's a, if you have a column store data or column store database and it's compressed and you have a good execution engine, it might just be faster to just, just scan the entire table rather than using indexes. So we're not going to worry about how do we build indexes to make the analytical queries go faster. We'll see when we talk about hash joins, we build a hash table, which is like an index, on the fly. Uh, what we're talking about here are actually indexes we want to maintain and keep in sync with the underlying tables to make the transaction queries run faster. So again, there's this classic trade-off between uh, how many indexes we want to have versus how, uh, how much additional space it's going to cost us to maintain them. Right? Everything's in memory. Indexes don't come for free. So that's going to be an issue. And then there's also the other issue of how do we actually update these indexes as we insert, update, and delete entries in our underlying tables, like that all doesn't come for free as well. So you could just build an index on every possible column combination you'd want. That would speed up every query. But it'd be expensive to maintain those things, so nobody actually does this. So again, the, the basic idea is just index is just like a glossary in your textbook. You can figure out what page you want to jump to without having to do a sequential scan through the whole thing. So there are two classes of index data structures we can have. Right. And again, this shouldn't be any, anything mind-blowing. This is just algorithms uh, or data structures 101. Right? We can have our order-preserving indexes or the hashing indexes or hash tables. So order-preserving indexes will maintain the keys for, that you're indexing on uh, in some kind of sorted order. Right? Some lexicographic order, like newest to old, or uh, smallest to greatest, or, or in the other direction. Um, and in practice, this is going to allow us to do all possible predicates we want to have in our queries. We can use the, the index, um, and we'll be able to achieve oh, its approximately log n uh, lookups. The alternative to this is a hash table index. And this is just like an associated array that's going to map the keys to the, the particular record that has that value. So you can only use the hash indexes for equality predicates when you have the entire key. You can't do any partial key lookups in hash index. And, but the benefit of this is you're going to get 01 lookups. 
You may have to land in a, in a bucket, and depending on how your hash table is implemented, you may have to scan until you find the entry that you want, which we'll talk about later in the, in the semester. But again, it's O1 versus log n. So our focus on here going forward for the next three lectures is on this first class of things. This will only primarily be useful for us when we talk about hash joins. When you call create index in pretty much every single uh, database system out there, you're going to get one of these. It might be a B plus tree, it might be a skip list, it might be what, whatever, right? But in general, every, every database system will give you one of these. In like th some systems like Postgres and other things, you can say create index using, and then you tell it what data structure you want. So in, in Postgres, you can say, I want a hash table index, um, but the default is this. Let me take an obvious guess why. Yes? Range queries? Exactly, range queries. What most people do when they first build the index is like, you know, do like a select count star or some, like, you know, some range just to do some quick lookup. And it'd be, people get pissed off if you build an index and then like you can't use it for any other query. You can't use it for the first query you throw at it. So these things are more general purpose. Uh, and this, this is what everyone goes with. So that's what we, again, focused on here today. So one additional thing I want to clarify also before we go forward is the distinction between a B tree and a B plus tree. I'm going to probably use these terms interchangeably. Uh, sometimes I'll say B plus tree, sometimes I'll say B tree. Also times you'll see in uh, documentation of existing, you know, real systems, they will sometimes say B plus tree and some other systems will say B tree. In practice though, it's always going to be a B plus tree. So the original B tree from 1972, uh, it was, you know, one of the first self-balancing trees. The way it was set up was that you can have the key value pairs for the data you're indexing be stored anywhere in the tree. So it could be in the leaf nodes or it could be on the inner nodes, right? And the reason why they did this is because they want to make sure that every key value pair, or every key for that matter, only appears once in the entire tree, right? In a B plus tree, the key values that are actually in the index, right, to say what the, what the index is based on or what the index is actually storing, at a logical level, they're only stored in the leaf nodes. And then in the inner nodes in the tree, those are just like guideposts that say whether you go left or right as you traverse it, right? And so what'll happen is you could end up deleting, logically deleting a key in a B plus tree and removes it from the, the bottom layer, the, the leaf nodes, but it may still exist in the, in the upper, upper nodes because it hasn't done a split or merge to, to remove it out, right? So, the, the benefit, the reason why everyone, everyone, everyone implements this is that if you want to do now range scans, uh, it's super efficient to do this because you just go, you, you just do a log n lookup to get to the bottom of the tree of what your starting point is for your range, and then you just scan along the leaf nodes and you find all the entries you want. And that's going to be a sequential scan depending on how you organize the, uh, those nodes. Whereas in this thing, you may have to balance up, up and down and therefore keep pointers in both directions to figure out how to go down and come back up, right? So again, in practice, as far as you know, everybody that says they implement a B tree in a, in a real system is more often than not implementing a B plus tree. So Postgres will say, if you look at the source code, it'll say B tree, but as far as I can tell, it's, it's, a, it's a B plus tree. Further confusing this is that there's also, so there's, a, there's, a, there's the original B tree and the original B plus tree but nobody actually really implements the original B plus tree as well. The modern variants of them combine features of all these other types of trees that came out around, came out around the same time in, in the, the 1980s and 1970s. Right, there's a B star tree, the B link tree was invented here at CMU. Uh, and so the B plus tree that people implement now, now includes bits and, bits and pieces of all these other types of trees. Right? So having sibling pointers, that comes from the B link tree. All right, so again, sometimes I'll say B plus tree, sometimes I'll say B, B tree, but I really mean this one here, where all the leaf, the, the actual key value pairs are always have to be in the leaf nodes. Okay? All right. And we'll see this also, that actually, another reason why people do this as well is that it makes it much easier to do uh, concurrent access or concurrent changes to the indexes because what will happen is since everything's always in the leaf node, any change you make always starts at the bottom and, and goes up. Right? Whereas in the, in the B tree, you could have one guy, that, the, uh, the top node, they make a change and have to do a split and merge, and then another guy below it is doing a split and merge, and now you have to manage those, uh, those changes coming from two different directions. Whereas in this one, it's always coming up. That makes your life a lot easier. 
All right, so the, um, where we're at now is that we spent the, the first couple of classes talking about how to do uh, uh, concurrent control for transactions on tuples. So we know how to use locks to protect the, uh, the objects in our database. We, we just use two-phase locking, and we have our shared locks, or exclusive locks, and depending on what the transaction wants to do, we know how to set those locks and protect things. The sort of weird thing about indexes is that it's storing data, but it's not considered the primary source location of the data, right? That's always going to be in the tables. And the way we can treat our indexes, even though we want to read and write to them the same way we read and write to tables, it's not the same. It's, we have to actually treat it differently because we don't actually care what the physical data structure looks like of our index as long as it's logically consistent. So what I mean by that is if I do a lookup in the index and I say, do you have key uh, one, two, three, the index come back and comes back and says yes. If, I, if now somebody else asserts a billion keys into that index, and now the physical location of where that key I looked up before is, is now in a different place, I don't care. As long as I come back and say, do you have key one, two, three, and, and it answers yes, then that's fine. So for this reason, we can't use the traditional concurrential methods that we talked about before. We don't want to do two-phase locking in our index because it doesn't make sense for someone to hold a, a lock on a node in the index the entire for the time length of the transaction, right? We just want to come in, do our do our change, or do whatever lookup we want to do, and then throw you know give up all of our latches and locks, and then come back later on and just do it all over again. So let's look at a really simple example of what I mean. So we have a simple uh, B plus tree here. Two, it holds two keys, key zero and key two, and it has one, one node, right? So if I do my lookup, I want to read K2. Lo and behold, I find it right there. That's fine. But now another transaction comes along and does an insert in K1. It should go in between these two guys. And since I can only hold two elements, I have to do a split. So now my index looks like this, where K2 now has been, been moved down to this other node here, and K0 has been moved over here. And again, now when I come back, in the same transaction, I don't care that uh, its, its primary location is now no longer in the node that I looked at before. It's now over here. That's fine because I asked the question to the index, do you have this key? It said yes. That's all I care about. Right? So this is an example of, 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 of well, we'll see it throughout this class, like we'll use latches to, to make sure that Transactions that are accessing the index at the same time don't have pointers to, to you know, invalid memory locations. Um, and then we'll also see how we use index locks in the paper you guys read about how to protect the logical contents of the, of the index. All right? So if you take the intro class uh, here with me last semester, then we spent time talking about the di distinction between locks and latches. Um, and this is in the paper that you guys read, which is a really uh, again, the reason why I have you guys read this, even though we're not going to actually implement anything that they talk about in that paper, uh, it's a great survey of just like all the things you got to think about when you're, when you're building indexes to make them make them work correctly in transactions. So we have to make this distinction in databases between lots and lots. So if you're coming from an OS background, uh, they would claim that what we're going to call latches is what they call locks. They're wrong. Okay. A lock is going to be a higher level uh, of, of protection primitive that's going to protect the logical contents of our, of our, of our database, the logical contents of our index. Right? And what will happen is we're going to hold these locks for the entire duration of the transaction because we want to protect, again, some logical notion or logical concept or entity in our database. And the way we're going to program using locks is that we got to have extra mechanisms in our database system to be able to roll back any changes that we may, may make to these objects that we're protecting with locks. Now, distinct, uh, distinguish this between a latch. A latch is going to be a, a, a low-level primitive that's going to protect a critical section in the index's internal data structure. Right? The, when you think of a node itself, like the, that, that region of memory, when we want to do reads and writes to it, we can protect that with a latch. And so, these things are going to be short-lived because we're only going to hold them for the, op for the duration of the operation that we're doing. So I can take a latch on a node, do my read, and then give it up right away. All right? And for this, we don't need to be able to roll back any changes because 
again, we're only doing it for the, the small change that we're doing to the actual physical data structure. So I can hold a latch, make a change, and then as soon as I release the latch, then it's done. Any, any additional logic I need about rolling back the overall changes, like last class we talked about, uh, I, I add something to an index and I abort, I need to roll back and, and then remove that thing. I w that's, a, that's a higher level concept that's protected by a lock, not a low level latch. So he also has this great table. Um, so Gertz Graffy was a, is a, you know, a, a, a well-known database researcher or database uh, systems engineer. Um, his name's going to come up multiple times throughout the semester when we talk about uh, Cascades query optimization or the, the Volcano uh, iterator model for doing query processing. So he's sort of a, he writes these great, sort of, more recently he writes these papers that are, or these, these surveys about covering everything you need to know about like one topic. So everything you need to know about, you know, B plus trees is, is something he's been spending time on, which is really cool. So he has this great table that says the, the distinguish between locks and latches about what they're protecting and how we're going to use them. So in a lock, what's going to separate user transactions, and we're going to protect the actual logical database contents, hold them for duration transactions. We have these four modes, and plus all the additional attention locks we can have. And the way we deal with that locks is through deadlock uh, detection resolution, using mechanisms like timeouts, aborts, and uh, uh, just stalls and waiting. And then we can keep this additional information in, in, a, in a centralized lock manager. Again, the latches are, again, the low-level primitives for protecting the physical data structure. And so this is protecting threads from each other, like two threads trying to update the, the single node in, in an index at the same time. Um, we only going to have read and write latches. We, we don't have anything else. Like, we don't have attention, uh, attention modes. And the way we're going to avoid deadlocks is through careful uh, programming. So what I mean by that is us as the database systems implementers, it's up to our job to make sure if we're using latches that we can't have deadlocks, right? Because there's not going to be some, some background thread doing deadlock detection to, to, to bail us out. So if we end up programming our system to have a deadlock, we're rude, no one else is there to help us. So we need to be very careful about how, how we use our latches and make sure that we can't have problems, OK? All right. So another thing that comes up in the paper, and we'll see, again, next class we'll focus, uh, we'll focus on this uh, in a bit more detail. But he talks about how people claim that they have uh, lock-free indexes, but it's unclear what they actually mean. And he basically says that there's two choices when someone says they have a lock-free index. So the first is that uh, it could be that they have the index has, has no locks as defined by us, no logical database locks. Right? So that means that transactions don't have to acquire locks to access and modify the database, but they're still going to have to use latches to protect the physical data structures when they make modifications. So you can sort of think of this as like the OCC method that we talked about uh, a couple lectures ago, right? We still have to use uh, latches to protect the tuples as we make changes to them, like append new versions, but I'm not acquiring a lock on the tuple itself. Right? There's, nothing, there's no lock manager keeping track of who holds what locks. The other choice is a index that has no latches. And for this would be, uh, we're going to use compare and swap uh, primitives to flip pointers around to atomically install updates without using any low level latches like mutexes, right? Um, and so of course this, when I mean, you still have to validate your transactions because the transaction may make a change to your lock free index. It may install a key that, again, it was allowed to do physically. But logically, there's some higher level concept about the correctness of, those, of the transactions that, that ran that we have to roll back that change, right? So for, for the way to think about this is we already talked about how to do this with the, the in-memory MVCC stuff we talked about before. And then next class, you guys, you read how to, how to build one of these, OK? All right, so let's actually talk about how you actually can implement a latch, right? Um, you know, in the, in the intro class we did last semester, I think you guys just used the standard mutex latch to protect things. I forget whether we, we provided that for you or, or whether there was a wrapper. Um, we now want to talk about the different ways to actually implement a latch going beyond the, the, the default one you get with C++ in the standard template library. So I think I asked before who here has, knows what compare and swap is. I just want to go over this real quickly at a high level and make sure we're all on the same page. So a... Compare and swap is an atomic instruction that's going to 
allow us to, in a, in a single step, in a single instruction, check the, the, the current contents of a location in memory, and if it's what we, what we think it should be, then we're allowed to install our, our, our new updated value, right? And so this here, like, of course, sync pool compare and swap, right? This is like a CPU intrinsic you get in, in C++, and there's different variants of them for different uh, data type sizes, right? This one's doing a 8-bit Boolean, I think. Um, actually, this one returns a Boolean whether it succeeds or not. So say we have a, a memory location here. Um, so when we invoke this function, we pass along that memory location, and we say, this is the value we want to compare against. And if that value is currently this, then install our new one here. So when we invoke this, right, we check this. It's 20. So we're allowed to install our change like that. And that's all done in a single instruction, which is super, super fast. Same, right? So there's different ways to, to actually write the code. I don't think you want to write the long, long form like this. There's like helper functions um, or CPU intrinsics that will then get compiled down, or the compiler rewrites them to be uh, the single instruction like this, right? Intrinsics are a basic way to like, think of it like it looks like a function in the actual code itself, but the compiler knows it actually maps to a single instruction, right? So you're not writing raw assembly to, to actually do this. All right, so again, this is the basic primitive we're going to use to implement a bunch of different latch, latches. So the, uh, the most Easiest latch to have, and if you've taken a basic OS course, this is the one everyone knows about, is just a, a blocking OS mutex, right? So the, in, in C++11, they added this now, uh, the standard, standard mutex, um, and this is just a, 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 a wrapper around the pthread mutex T. Actually, just a wrapper around a few. Does so anybody know what, what a futex is? All right, stands for fast user space mutex. So the... The way this basically works is that it's going to have a spin latch, which we'll talk about the, the test and set spin latch in the next slide. It has that in user space, because those things are really fast. And if you, if you, if you can acquire that, then you're done. You, you, know, you, have, you have the latch. If you can't acquire it, then you go down to the operating system and tell it that, hey, I, need, I, need this, I want to get this, this mutex at this memory location. I can't get it. Deschedule my thread. And so it goes in the scheduler and updates your status and says you're waiting for this memory location, therefore you shouldn't be given any time slices. So that's really expensive. All right, it takes about 25 nanoseconds to do this. All right, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it is. Compared to sort of like the test and set is a single instruction we saw in the last slide. So right, the way you write your code is like you define your mutex, and then you can call you know, lock and unlock here. And again, what will happen is if you can't get the, the fast spin lock in user space, you go down the operating system and say, I can't get this, don't schedule me. And again, anytime you go in the operating system, that's always expensive. It's, it's a syscall. Uh, the, the, the operating system is going to have the kernel, at least in Linux, is going to have its own latches protecting its own data structures down below, which may now start contending with other things running the system. Right? They're, not, they're not even related to your database system. Right? If there's some file system code running, it may be down to the kernel as well, and now you're contending against that. So syscalls are our are, are enemy. The operating system is our frenemy. We want to avoid talking to it as much as possible. So that's why you never want to use uh, the standard template mutex. You always want to write our latches in, in our database system itself. So I checked this morning on our, the new code, and we seem to be pretty clean about not using mutexes anywhere, which I'm quite happy to see. Last year on the old code, we had these things all over the place, right? It was like. It was it was just like spreading. Um, it was really bad. And I felt, it felt like, you know, I come into this class and I tell you guys don't use mutexes. And then we were like, you know, being hypocritical because our system had, it, had them all over the place. It's a mess. Um, all right. So again, the key thing to understand about this is that with the futex, you get a user space spin latch first. If you can't get that, then you go down the OS and use a full mutex, which is bad, slow. All right. So what is a spin, what is a spin lock or test and set spin lock? So th again, this, this part sucks because like in the database systems, database systems we're going to call these latches, but the latch we're going to use most often is, is often called a spin lock, right? It's fine. All right, so these are super efficient because it, as I showed when I showed you the compare and swap, it's a single instruction to go check that memory location, check the value, and then swap it with our new one if, if, we, if it's what we expect there to be, right? So that's super fast. 
The downside is, we'll see in a second, is that this is not very scalable and it's not very cash friendly. Right? Again, I'll, I'll explain what I mean in a second. So you can get this again in C11. They now have this atomic template, and then you pass in whatever the, the type it is that you want to be atomic. Right? And what will happen is if it if it the the thing you put in here is uh, the size of it is is enough for a uh, like the built-in instructions to do compare and swap. Like if it's a 16-bit value or type you're putting in here, there's a 16-bit compare and swap instruction, so that can be fully atomic. If you put in something that isn't that there isn't equivalent compare and swap instruction, then the 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 compiler will then rewrite that using uh, mutexes, like you know, if you know, they'll, they'll rewrite the code for you or the, the binary, the the assembly to use mutexes and, and make it look like it's really atomic, but it's not. Sorry, it's atomic, but it's not the uh, compare and swap, the faster one. All right, so here's how we would implement this. So again, C++11 provides you a nice atomic flag, and this is just an alias for atomic boolean. But this is actually guaranteed to be always implemented with a compare and swap instruction, right? In depending on what hardware you're on, you may end up with like, as I said, you may say you may end up with one that's using mutex, um, but the, the the language guarantees that this will be compare and swap. So we define our latch, and then we have if we want to go acquire it, we always have this little while loop that says if latch dot test and set, and then if this this wants to take whatever this wants to set the latch to be true if the current value is false, and then it returns whatever the old value was. So in this case here, if it's already set to true, meaning somebody else holds the latch, then this thing returns true because the current value or the previous value is true. So that's why this loops back down. So now, if I do this, I try to set it and I can't, this comes back as true. Now I'm inside this while loop and I have to write some logic to figure out what I actually should, should do. So the easiest thing to do is just, just retry this again, right? Spin forever. That's why it's called a spin lock, a spin latch, because you're just spinning it over and over again trying to, to acquire the latch until you, you can get it. And again, these latches are protecting uh, critical sections that are not supposed to be really big. So the idea here is that someone went and say, you know, updated the node, that's going to maybe take a few nanoseconds or a few instructions. So they're not going to be holding this latch for a long time. So rather than me going down to the operating system and descheduling myself, I'll just spin until they're done, and then I can pop in and get it. Right? So again, the easiest thing to do is just retry. If I try for a couple of times and I realize I'm not going to get it, I could yield my thread. Or I could just say I've tried too much and I, I have to abort myself. And then whatever else, you know, whatever logic I have, whatever operations I did that were depending on this thing, you know, this thing to succeed, if this doesn't succeed, then I have to manually roll that back myself. But you, ideally, you don't want to write code that way, right? So, um, what's the problem with this? Let me take a guess. All right. So one thing here is that the the operating system thinks we're actually doing useful work. We're actually because we're just keep executing the instructions. It doesn't know that it's, you're, wait, you're doing your useless computation. It doesn't know that you're waiting for this memory region to get freed up before you can acquire it. So the OS is going to keep scheduling your thread. That's fine. But you're basically going to be executing the same function over and over and over again. And if now you have a lot of cores trying to all acquire the same latch at the same time, this is going to end up with a lot of traffic on the actual underlying hardware. So let's look at a really simple example here. Say I have two cores. All right? Or it's, think of it like it's two sockets, right? Each, each, each with a single core. And so the latch I want to acquire is over here in memory for this CPU here. So for this thread, if he's just spinning, that's sending those instructions over the underlying bus on, on the motherboard to this, this socket here to try to get that, uh, try to set that value in the you know, for that memory region over here. So let's say that some other thread holds this, and two guys are both trying to get it. The memory is here, so this guy can call a test and set uh, locally, and that's fast. But this thing is is going over the over the bus and trying to set it over here. So now instead of two threads, what if there's you know 20 threads all trying to do this? All right. So the 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 cache locality you get from this is is, is really bad, 
if, if now you start scaling this out, right? Because again, for every test and set, it's another instruction that goes over the wire, All right? So there's a way to improve this. Uh, and these are called Q-based spin locks, or sometimes called MCS locks. Um, and MCS stands for the, the two dudes that made this, Mallory, Malore, Crumney, and Scott. So this was actually added. This is, I think this idea has been around for a while, but Linux added this in, the, in their kernel to protect their data structures in like 2014. Um, but this is something database people have, been, have known about for a while as well. So these are going to be more efficient than the stupid, dirty OS mutex. I shouldn't say stupid, but the dirty OS mutex. And then, but it's going to get better cache locality than the simple test and set spin lock, right? So the way it would work is that we have to manage this ourselves. Like, so this is this is just saying that uh, I'm declaring in this in this standard template that I want to have a pointer to something called a latch, which I'll show in a second. That I want this thing to be atomic, but the the C++ isn't going to do what we're describing here for us. We have to do this ourselves. All right, so let's say we have a, our base latch, which is what this thing is, is pointing to. And this base latch is just a struct that just has a pointer to, uh, a 64-bit pointer to the next latch in the queue. So at this point here, nobody holds the latch because this thing is set to null. So my first CPU comes along, and it wants to acquire this latch. So what it's going to do is it's going to set up its own latch uh, in the queue with its own next pointer as well. And it's going to go to the first one and try to do a compare and swap on this on this next field and set it to be if that succeeds. If a compare and swap here succeeds and now it points to his latch, then this guy has successfully acquired the latch and can go off and do it, do whatever it wants to do. The next thread comes along, and again it follows the the, the starting memory address for our for our 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 spin lock or, or latch, it lands here, tries to do a compare and swap on this. It's, it fails because CPU1 has already set up that pointer. So then it follows that pointer and says, all right, well, this is the next one in my queue. Let me try to do a compare and swap on this guy. And then this succeeds and now points to him. So now he's now spinning, waiting, waiting on this latch here, this memory solution. If any other thread comes along, they do the same thing, compare and swap fails. Follow, the, follow down the, the list, compare, compare and swap fails again, follows down the list, then the compare and, compare and swap succeeds, and now it's in the queue. So now these two threads are waiting for the first guy. So this one's going to spin on this memory address, and then this one's going to spin on that memory address. Right? So the underlying hardware in the OS is smart enough to recognize, oh, this thread running on maybe this other socket here is always trying to read this memory address on this other socket over here. So let me just move that memory address to be now physically stored in, this, in, the, in the NUMA region where this guy is actually running. Right? You can actually provide hints also as well. Like you can do this when, using NUMA control. We'll, we'll see this later on. But you can actually tell the, the, the CPU, move this memory address to, from this DIM to this DIM. Right? And then now you don't have any network traffic going over the bus between sockets. I'm just accessing thing that's in my local CPU cache. And that's really fast. All right? So this seems awesome, right? This, this, is, this is a definite win. Uh, the only tricky thing that you, it's the, if you have to pull out guys you know, somewhere with Q, then you have to go to the organization. It's not much extra work to, to deep somebody from this than in the spin latch case where I just say, all right, I'm done, and you walk away, all right? So I don't think we had this implemented in our system. Uh, Actually, we use the, the Intel thread building block library, and I don't know how they implement their spin latches. We, we should look into that. Um, but again, I think this, this, if, if you're working in a highly parallel environment, this, this is a better approach. All right, so the last type is a latch called reader writer latches. Um, and this is, allows you to have concurrent readers uh, running at the same time, um, and then a single writer. So for this one, a latch now is going to be comprised of uh, two types of latches, the re-latch and the right latch. And then you're going to have counters to keep track of the number of threads that currently hold the latch and the number of threads that are currently waiting to acquire the latch. So my first thread comes along and wants to acquire the, the re-latch. So at this point here, both the, the right latch and the re-latch are unset. Right? There's nobody, nobody holds it yet. 
So I can do a compare and swap to now acquire it, set this thing to one, and now I hold the latch. Now the thread comes along, same thing. I see that this thing is set to one. Nobody else is waiting. There's no writer waiting to acquire this. So I can update the counter, and then now I've, I've had it at two. So I can have concurrent readers access the, the data structure or the, current, the critical section at the same time. Right? Whereas a single spin latch, you, you, you just can't do that because all you know is whether it's set or not. So our, right, our, our writer thread shows up, tries to get the right latch. That fails because the read latch is being held. So then we, just, we, we, we can spin and wait. Now there we go. Spin and wait for fire that. Um, and then we just up to, update ourselves to let everyone else know that we're waiting. The third thread comes along, tries to get the read latch. All right, this one sees that the, there's somebody holding the right latch or waiting for the right latch. So we will just, uh, we will stall and wait for ourselves here. So that way when these guys drain out, they can then acquire it. Um, and then that's not starving out our writers. Because otherwise this thing can, can keep going forever and our writer latches, our writers will never acquire the latch. So this is really useful in data structures where you know that the, uh, where you know that the, 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 the access pattern of the, of the workload is, is such that it's, you know, it's, it's going to be mostly read only, but every so often you need somebody to come along and actually do a write. Right? And you, you'll see this actually in the, the, for the first project, there's a particular, you know, I'm not saying you have to use a read or write or latch, but there's a, a clear example where something is going to be reading something, there'll be more things reading something than, than writing something. Yes? So the condition for waiting for a read is if someone is waiting to write? His question is, the condition for determining whether you, whether you wait when you try to acquire the read latch that it also be, is being held by somebody else is that if anybody's waiting for a write, then I should, I should wait. So it's, this is one way to implement it. I'm not saying, that there, I'm not saying there is one way that's better than another. Like you can tweak this implementation based on what you think the access pattern will be for the critical section that you're protecting. So it may be the case that you want to just, you know, have your reader latches go, you know, to have the reader threads acquire the read latch as fast as possible, who cares whether something's waiting, waiting here. That may be bad, right? Because you may start out the writers, but again, depending on what you're protecting, that would be okay. Same thing too, now I have other writer threads coming along here. Should they be allowed to go, you know, when this guy gives it up, go get it, you know, immediately afterwards as well, or should I ping pong and let this other one get it? Depends on the implementation, depends on what you're protecting. Okay. All right, so now that we know how to implement latches, let's talk about how to do, uh, use them to protect our, you know, our, our tree data structure, our tree index. So for this one, we'll use the B plus tree as our, our uh, sort of canonical index to understand how we want to do this. Um, but the techniques we're talking about here are still applicable for, uh, uh, for other types of trees, right? Red black trees and things like that. Um, so for this one, we're going to show how we want to do what's called latch crabbing or coupling. It's basically the, the standard technique for allowing us to allow for concurrent reader, reader writers on our, on our B plus tree, right? So what's going to happen is that as threads enter the index, they're going to have to acquire the latch uh, on that node before they're at to, to actually look at it and figure out whether the data they're looking for is in, in it or not. And so what will happen is as you go down, you want to release the latches behind you in things you, from nodes you already visited when you know it's safe to do this. And we're going to, we're going to consider a parent node or ancestor node to be safe from a child node if we know that we're not going to do any splits or merges below us. So if we're doing an insert, we know that whatever is below us in the tree will not cause us to have to split the node that's above us. So in that case, we can release the latch on it. Right? For same thing for, to, for doing a delete, as long as the, the, in, the, the node is at least half full, then we, don't, we know we're not going to do any coalescing. We, don't, we know we're not going to do any merging from, uh, because of that delete. So we can release latches above us. Right? So the standard technique way to do latch crabbing, again, start from the root, take read latches all the way down, and unlock the parent immediately because you're not modifying anything. And then for insert and deletes, as you go down, you acquire right latches as needed. And then if the... If your child is safe, then you can release the, all the, the latches on your parent. So let's look at a simple example to do search on 23. So it's a really simple index. We want to look up and try to find this key here, 23. So since I'm read only, I take a read latch on the first guy, get to the second one, 
once I have the latch on this, then I know I can release the latch above me, right? Because I'm, it's read-only, I'm not making any changes, so I don't have to worry about uh, any modification, uh, you know, dis or ascending up the tree and modifying this thing. So we can go ahead and release that latch. Then we get down here, get our, get our latch on, on F, and then we release latch on C, and then we can do our read and we're done, right? So again, we're, we're, we're coupling locks as we go down, or it's crabbing because it's supposed to be how crab walks. Um, once we know we, we can access the node uh, safely, we, we then move to it and then release our parent. All right, so now we want to do a delete, get a right latch on the root, get down to the C. In this case here, because this thing is, uh, is half full or less, uh, we don't know whether this thing would cause us to do the delete down below in the leaf nodes. We don't know whether that's going to cause us to have to do a merge up above this. So we can't release the latch on this yet. But then once we get down here, where we actually want to do our delete, we know this thing is more than half full, right? So at this point here, the C and A are considered safe. So we can go ahead and release the latches on those guys. Because so, we know whatever change we make down here is localized to this, right? And we can blow it away. All right, insert 40, same thing, right? Right latch, get to here, right latch. This thing here, since we have space for any uh, key we may have to store in this. We can release the latch on A. Then we get down to where we're going to actually insert here. In this case here, now we're actually going to have to do a split. So we have to still maintain the latch on this, um, do our insert, and then uh, rebalance like that. Right? Again, the way we're going to emit these latches are using one of the techniques that we talked about before. Most likely for these operations, it could be a simple, uh, the, the MCS Q-based locks or spin latches or the, the regular spin latch. You wouldn't want to do a reader writer latch for this. All right. So what's the first thing we did for all of the, 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 the modifications we made to our index? Well, we always took the, the, the right latch on the root. Right? And that means that's going to be a, a, a single bottleneck in the entire system because we're always going to that, that, that first node, acquiring the right latch. That prevents anybody else from reading or writing to it at the same time. So therefore, anytime we modify the index, that's going to become a, a big bottleneck. So we can do a better approach, which actually comes from this paper from 1977, where you basically assume optimistically that you're not going to have any conflicts or not going to have any splits and merges when you get to the bottom to the leaf nodes in the B plus tree. So therefore, you take read latches all the way down as if you're doing a, a search or, or a lookup. And then when you get to those leaf nodes, then, then you actually take the, the, the right latch you need, right? So this is pretty straightforward. So again, I take a read latch on A, read latch on C. At this point here, I know I'm safe because I'm deleting. Um, but uh, I'm deleting here. Yeah, I'm, I'm deleting here. But I know that I can absorb this. Actually, that's wrong. Yeah, fuck. No, 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 sorry, that's right, that's right. Yeah, you take read latches all the way down, right? And then just when you get here, you take a right latch. Um, then I can delete my entry, and I'm OK. If I got here, when I try the, try the, the, the right latch and recognize that I would have to then go back and uh, merge this guy, then I have to abort the operation. I didn't make any change yet, so that's OK. And just re repeat the process using the right latches all the way down. Right, so you, you go re-latches all the way until you get to the last one, then acquire the right latch. And then if, you, if, you, if your assumption was wrong, then you abort the operation. If your assumption was correct, then you're OK. Right? So at this point here, right, again, you just take relatches all the way here. Then when you examine this thing, you say, oh, I'm OK. Therefore, release everything, and then do my change. Yeah, sorry. OK. So um, again, the, the, the key thing to point out here is that the, the, the latches we're using protect the physical data structure. Again, we don't care about whether things get moved around inside of memory, we just worry about making a change to the index and having it now point to some memory location that doesn't exist anymore. Right? That would be bad because that would we, we, we get a seg fault when our threads try to read something. So the way to think about this is that we're releasing latches immediately after we're done whatever operation we want to do is. And again, that's how we define what our latches are doing. But that's going to not going to protect us from all the anomaly stuff that we talked about before that we want to avoid when we run transactions of seeing data that uh, that 
you know, seeing data that, that, that wasn't there the first time we did a lookup and then it's there the second time, or doing a lookup on data and then the data disappears, right? These, these are the phantom issues we want to deal with. So let's look at two scenarios where latches are not going to help us. So let's say we have a transaction that was do a read on 25, right? So we just do the, the, the crabbing stuff, we take latches all the way down, we get down here uh, to this node, and then we see that 25 isn't there. That's fine, okay. But now uh, my transaction goes off, transaction one goes off and does other things, transaction two starts, and it does an insert in 25. So again, right latches all the way down, it's allowed to do that, gets to this point here, inserts 25, and it's done. Now transaction one comes back and does the, says, well, I knew 25 didn't exist before, so let me try to insert it now. So now when it gets down here, I took latches all the way down. That's fine, because again, that protected the physical data structure. Nobody else was making modification at the same time I was. So that's all fine. But now when I try to do my insert 25, I thought it didn't exist because when I asked it whether it existed in the first time, it said no. Then I try to insert it. And now the index says, oh, no, 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 you can't insert that. I do have this, right? So latches aren't going to help us with this. We're still screwed. So that, that, again, that's a phantom. That's one problem. The next issue is now we want to do like a range scan. Right, so it's here, this transaction wants to do a range scan on 12 to 23. So again, I take read latches all the way down. I get to my leaf node, right? This is the starting point for my scan, 12. And now I'm going to scan across the leaf nodes and take latches in that direction and to see this range, right? Then the, tr the transaction one gets stalled, does other stuff. Transaction two comes along, inserts 21, right? Finds it here, inserts it into this node here. Again, it was allowed to do that. The latches, it acquired the correct latches. Everything's fine. But now if I do the exact same scan again, I'm going to get a different result because now I'm going to get 12, 21, 23, whereas before I only got 12 and 23, right? So again, latches are protecting the physical data structure, but we need something else to make sure that we don't have these anomalies. Now, when we talked about the in-memory vaulting virtual concurrency control from Hyper, Hecaton, and Cicada, they had other mechanisms than what we're talking about here to make sure that these things didn't happen. So everyone remember what Hecaton would do to prevent this one. It would run the scan all over again when you did validation. And if it got back a different result, it wouldn't allow your transaction to commit. So again, latches don't protect you, just that extra scan protects the logical contents to say, yeah, I, I didn't, when I ran it the first time, I saw everything I saw, I would see when I ran it again later on, right? All right, so this is what, this is what index locks are gonna protect, help us with. So the index locks are gonna, a way to protect the logical contents of the indexes from other transactions that are modifying at the same time. So again, the reason why we have to do this extra stuff is because the index are essentially is like this auxiliary data structure that's a copy of the, what's in the table. Right? Transactions are updating the, the, the tables, and we would see those changes, and they can update these indexes as well. So we need to make sure that we see things correctly. So the difference between what we're talking about here versus index latches are, is that same stuff I talked about with, with, with that table in the beginning from the paper. So these index locks are going to be held for the duration of the transaction. Uh, we only have to acquire them in the leaf nodes. We don't care about what's above us in the index or in the inner nodes because, again, the, in a B plus tree, the leaf nodes are where the actual data is being stored. Now, one difference, though, between latches here is that we're not going to actually want to store the, these locks in our data structure itself. In the case of those latches, those latches we actually store in memory inside the node. Right, so every, so every index node you have a little header, and that header you, is where you want to store maybe your, your latch. You don't want to store these locks in the index because, as we'll see in a second, or as, as we saw when we were doing splits and merges, the memory location of where the logical keys exist are going to move around. And now if I have to keep track of what locks I, ha I hold, then anytime I, I do a split and merge, I have to figure out, well, who holds this lock? Let me go update its pointers and now point to its new location. If, if I'm pointing just directly to the node that has it. So by decoupling this, we can allow the physical data structure to get, to change its, its organization without having to update where we, you know, how we find out what locks we hold. So the techniques we're talking about here, again, we're describing in the context of B plus tree, 
But as far as I know, these, these can be used for any order preserving index. They're not specific to a B plus tree. Right, where the, where the latch coupling stuff is, 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 is specific to a B plus tree. All right, so the way we're going to maintain the information about our locks is the classic lock table that we, that we talked about under two phase locking. So there's some auxiliary data structure, some auxiliary hash table that's going to have a way to do lookups and say for a particular lock type and, and a lock you know, uh, scope. Here's the hash table that, can, that, that, that maintains the, the list of the transactions that are waiting to acquire the locks or hold that locks. Right? And it, it also can keep track of what mode the, the, the locks are being held under. Right? So again, what makes this sort of confusing is that we take latches as we traverse the index to get to, from, from node to node. Then in order to protect certain regions inside the index domain, we have to do lookups in our lock table, which we also have to protect with latches, right? So we take latches into the index and then take latches into the lock table to look at what locks are being held on the index, right? So as far as I know, no in-memory database system actually implements any of what we're talking about here. The reason why I'm covering it because I think it's useful to understand, again, part of the distinction between the disk-based systems and the in-memory systems Right, to understand like it's more than just, oh, everything's in memory, everything's on disk. There's fundamental changes to how the architecture is actually being implemented. And the in-memory database systems choose not to do these techniques because instead they rather do the, the validation stuff we saw in Hecaton or the precision locking stuff we saw in, in, in Hyper because those things actually are much faster when everything's in memory. Right? In a disk-based system, the index actually may get swapped out the disk, but this, the lock table always stays in memory. And so that's, you know, because this is always in memory, this, will be, this is better for things that may you know, reside on disk. But you pay the penalty of having to do this lookup, as we'll see in a second, to go look in this lock table to figure out what locks are being held on, on index nodes. OK. So let's talk about five different locking schemes that were covered in the paper. So the first one, predicate locks, again, nobody actually implements this, but it's good to understand for historical reasons. And then we'll start from the key value locks and then sort of build up and add more and more things until we get to the final one, which is the hierarchical locking. This is like the full, the full locking suite you can have, the full protection. Um, and this is, what, this is like what commercial guys like DB2, they, they implement these things. So predicate locks are, uh, are typological locks that were actually first proposed in from the IBM System R project. You've heard me talk about System R before. Uh, the reason why I like it so much is because you know, it, was, it was one of the first database systems, relational database systems they were building back in the 1970s. And they basically said, hey, here's this abstract idea of a relational database. Let's get eight really smart people with PhDs in a single room, and they'll figure it out. And they figured it out. Right? And one of the things that they invented was this, this idea of predicate locking, because they, they recognized they needed to have a way to protect, uh, protect data and indexes beyond just sort of this simple two-phase locking techniques that we talked about before to avoid phantoms. So the way it's going to work is that you're going to have shared locks for any predicate you would have in a where clause for a select query. And then you define exclusive locks for the where clauses that are, that are defined in a update, insert, and delete queries. And the, and the way you think about this, you're going to map this to a multi-dimensional space see whether there's, there's intersections between these different locks. And if you do, then you know that there's a conflict and you have to make a decision about whether one, one query is allowed to proceed versus another. So let's look at a really simple example. And hopefully on a 2D, 2D projection, this will make, make sense. So say I have two queries. I have one table, I have the account table. The first query wants to do a summation on the balance for the account where the name equals Biggie. And then there's another query, a transaction that wants to insert a new record for the account biggie with a, with a value of 100. So this is going to be a 2D projection of all the records in the account table. So if I want to determine whether these two queries conflict, right? they're both operating on the same, same data, then I can sort of map. I look at the where clause here, and I say, well, this region of the table space is where all tuples for the, have the account name biggie. And then for this, uh, for the insert query, Here's another region where it's the name equals Biggie and the balance equals 100. Because this thing intersects with this thing, then I know that these, these queries are actually conflicting. 
and therefore I have to make sure that if, if this thing here ran first, I would have a phantom if I allowed this query to run and do the insert because I wouldn't have seen the insert before I ran the query, but I would see it afterwards, and therefore that would be a, a, phantom, and a phantom anomaly, and I can't allow the, the insert query to run. So again, this is super, super easy for us to look at in this example here and see, oh yeah, these are, these are conflicting. But now think about like I have like really big where clauses uh, with a lot of predicates or in a lot of queries running at the same time. How do I actually map that and find those intersections is, is really hard. And so that's why nobody actually, nobody actually ever implemented this. The precision locking stuff from Hyper is an approximation of this. And then for them, rather than looking at the intersection between different queries, they only look at the where clause from one query and then look at the what tuples or what, what delta records overlap with it. And you can always think of the delta records as like a, a materialized tuple, and you just check to see whether the where clause evaluates to true for each tuple in the delta record. Right? So they're not trying to take arbitrary queries and, and comparing them, or, which in the case you have to do it in, in predicate locks. Now the, the advantage of this is actually you can, for the most part, you can almost always figure out whether two queries are going to conflict without actually running the query. Right? In the case of Hyper, the, you, you can only do the precision locking after you run the query. Because right? you have to get the, the delta records. For this thing here, I don't actually need to run anything in the, in the database. I just look at the queries themselves. Which is nice, but again, nobody implements this. All right. Uh, so the next, so let's actually talk about what's actually practical, what people would actually implement. So the most simplest type of key index lock is a key value lock. And it, this is super simple to understand. It's just a way to say, I now have a lock on a single key in my index. Right? So I can take a lock on 14. And that prevents anybody else from, from from deleting this or, or changing this. So now, the tricky thing though is sometimes I want to take a lock on things that don't exist yet. So let's say I want to take a lock key or a, you know key value lock in my index on 15. 15 doesn't exist yet. It would go here, right? So and I, my, I did that one example where I showed like I did a lookup to see whether the key existed and then it didn't, and then I tried to insert into it, but then somebody else came along and inserted before I did. I could take a key value lock and say I'm going to insert 15. Let me let me go actually go lock it, and this is another reason why you can't store these locks inside the key, the, the node itself is because the the size of these these you know virtual nodes or, or gaps are infinite, right? And I, if I have to pre-allocate slots in my node in memory to say here's all the in, the, the key value locks I could be storing in this node, it, you know you, you spend more space doing that than the actual data itself. So that's why you put everything out into a separate hash table. The next type of lock are gap locks, right? So again, this is almost, this is the example I said before. We're like now in between these keys, I can maintain. I, I have these gaps, and I can now define locks and say I have a lock between uh, where two the gap between two keys. So this is a gap lock between 14 and 16 exclusive. So if anybody tries to insert something at the value of, you know you know 15, whether it's a decimal or or, or the or the or the integer then this lock would then protect that. So now we do more complicated things and build upon this, if we can have, uh, actually go back to this real quick. Again, another good reason why you can't store this in the index itself, or the node itself, is because let's say that I, I have the gap lock on, on the space here between 14 and 16, but now I have to do a split. And now 14 is on one node, and 16 on, is on another node, and now my gap spans two nodes. If I was storing this gap lock in the index, where should it actually be? Should it be on 14's node or 16's node? All right, it's, that's not easy to do. If I just have it up in my, my separate index lock table, then that solves that problem. All right, uh, I'm trying to rush through because I want to get through the teach you guys about profiling real quickly. Key value locks, again, this is now building upon the, the, the using the gap locks and, the key, and key value locks to now take locks on ranges. And now we also want to introduce lock modes the same way we had lock modes in our two-phase locking, because now if we want to have larger regions covered by locks, we may want to not take an exact exclusive lock or a shared lock on it. We may want to say, here's an intention of what we want to do. Right? So let's say here I want to do a, uh, a next key lock 
from 14 and 16, 14 inclusive, 16 exclusive. So this is the combination of taking the key value lock on 14 and then the gap lock on the space in between them, right? The alternative is to do a prior key lock, 12 to 14, so this gives me 14 inclusive and then 12 exclusive. So as far as I know, I think you always have to go in one direction. So it either has to be a next, can only be next key locks or only prior key locks. You can't mix them because I think you, you would end up with deadlocks and you have, to, you have to do extra work to be able to deal with it. Now doing hierarchical locking, can now we take locks on larger regions. So we could take a, uh, a, a range lock on 10 up to the gap to 16. But again, instead of saying that it's either shared or exclusive, I can do an intention lock and say, uh, I'm, I'm intention exclusive that somewhere inside this, this region, I'm gonna take an exclusive lock. So I can take an exclusive lock on 14 and 16. Now another transaction come along, it could also get the intention or exclusive lock on, uh, on, on the entire of this region as well. But then inside of this, it takes an exclusive lock on just this piece here. And that doesn't cl conflict with this. Um, and then so they're, they're allowed to commute. Then we take, take guess why you want to do these higher level intention locks. If you took the intro class, you should know why. What's that? Exactly. So you said to reduce number of locks, you have to take in the lock manager. So say if I want to do a share lock on the entire node, I don't want to do a share lock on every single key value and every single gap. I can take a share lock on the entire thing, right? Because that's, that's, that's fewer lookups in the index, the index lock table. And so these intention locks allow me to, to sort of protect myself from, I don't know maybe what region down below I'm going to be doing something, but let me start with that, see whether I can actually get this, this higher level intention lock. If I can, then I can go ahead and take the smaller lock down below, the, the more, more, more uh, refined one. But I, basically I can figure out before I get to the, the piece I actually want to take the lock on, am I ever actually going to be able to get it, get it or not? So instead of saying getting, getting individual locks and checking to see can I acquire it and maybe to the last one you finally can't get it, right? I can check at the very beginning whether it's going to succeed or not. Yes? Uh, could you please return to the key range locking in the previous slide? Like, yes. Uh, for example, if I want to scan the range from 13 to 15, what, uh, what lock should I take? So this question is, if I want to scan from the... the 13 to 15. 13 to 15? Yes, because I don't know that 13 and 15 is not present here, right? Yeah, so his question is, if I want to scan 13 to 15, what locks do I take? You would take the, uh, you would take a range lock from, uh, from 12 exclusive to, you said 13 or what, to 15? 15. Right, 12, 12, 12 inclusive, 13 inclusive to, to 15 inclusive. You can take locks on any size, size of ranges. But the, the main thing I'm pointing out is like, you're not, it's not like a, like a key value lock where you're taking, I know this key exists, I'm taking a lock on it. You're taking a lock on ranges, right? And now you can, like, it's sort of like the predicate locks, right? Where it can be sort of arbitrary uh, where clauses, essentially arbitrary ranges. But really the, the, the number of operations I'm, I care about to do these comparisons are actually quite small, right? It's either like, is something this key or is something in this range? Right? The, the number of operations I can do that to, that to protect myself against are limited. So taking the, the, the range lock from this to this is, pro is not a problem for us to figure out what people conflict with us or not. Yes, then the question is, what is the relationship between a key range lock with a deep tree? Because if I'm, uh, if I'm taking if I'm scanning from 13 to 15, I can take a key range lock from 13 to 15, then I think it is not, um, it, it, it has nothing to do with what is inside the tree leaf, the tree leaf node like drawing in this picture. Yeah, so this question is, this question is, if I can take a range lock from say 13 to 15, yeah. th that doesn't actually exist in this index node, then how, how does this relate to the index locks? How does the physical data structure relate to the, the index locks we're talking about here? Um, yes, because uh, no, matter, no matter what keys are present in, 
for example, in this node, yes. I can take the range log from 30 to 15. Yes. So, so what is the relationship between the range log and, and the contents present in the Got it. So his question is, what is the relationship between a range log and the contents of a B plus tree node? Yeah, so again, we're not storing any of those locks in the node itself. Mm -hmm. So I can take a lock on in, in the index lock table without actually having to traverse the index. Okay, so if I want to take a range lock, I don't need to know what is in the yes. tree. I just go directly to the right. Side. So he said that if I want to take a range lock on an index, I don't need to traverse the index to figure out what's in it or not. I can take it in the lock table. Correct, yes. Yes. Again, because things could move around in memory and it doesn't make sense to store like the physical regions of for my locks because it, it may change as other trans, other threads are updating the index. Okay. All right, that was a bit rushed, but that's okay. So because I want to get to the stuff that's related for the first project. Okay. So the main takeaway from this is that the the that's Peloton. I should have fixed that. Sorry. Um, <laughs> this is still true. We we're still not doing. Uh, we're still not doing serializable isolation, right? We only do snaps isolation because we're not going to implement the precision locking stuff that's from Hyper. In the case of Peloton, with this old code, like in the paper you guys read, for that, like the 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 staring to the abyss paper, or the um no the the best paper, it talked about being serializable, even though we don't support serializable. That's because we rewrote all the benchmarks to not do any range scans. If you don't have range scans, you don't have a, you don't you know you don't have serializability, serializability problems. All right. So again, the main takeaway from all of this is that. There's a bunch of extra crap we could do that we're not going to do with index locks to provide serializability. But instead, we can target on the in-memory approaches we saw with the, the other systems to achieve basically the same thing that the index locks give for us, right? And that the 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 coupling of the the, the data structure of the of the index lock table and the actual physical data structure it provides us the ability to take those locks. Uh, at arbitrary points in the, the key domain without worrying about how the underlying physical data structure is actually implemented. We use latches to protect the physical data structure and locks to protect the logical contents. Okay, we have five minutes, let's jump through this. So I want to give a really quick crash course on the profiling in, in the, the database system. So for project one, you guys are required to use perf. Quick show of hands, who, who has used perf before? One. Perfect. Okay. Who here has used call grind before or val grind? All right. More. That's what I expected. Okay. Fine. Good. So uh, let's talk about what, what we actually want to do. So let's start with a really simple program that has two functions, foo and bar. Right? So say we want to speed this thing up. Right? And we only have GDB. The stupidest thing we could do, or the easiest thing to do, is just run our, our program. And every, in GDB, and every so often, we, we pause execution, we look, look at the stack trace and say, well, where are our threads executing? And then we just mainly count the where, what functions are being invoked the most, right? I think we, we can be a little bit smart about this. We can maybe have a little robot hit the keyboard and just you know, hit pause, 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 right? But still, that's, that's stupid, right? So, Say we then collect uh, 10 stack traces for this, and you, you know, whether it's a robot or not, it doesn't matter. And then we look at those stack traces, and six out of the 10 times we got samples from these, we were going to be, we were in the foo, um, the foo function, right? So we know from this that roughly 6% of our time is spent in the foo function. Um, and obviously, we, if the more samples we get, you know, we, we have a robot or not, then we'll get better accuracy with this. But for just assume that, that it's 60%. So say now we optimize foo to be two times faster. What's the expected overall speed up of this? 30%. Why? Because you only shaved half the time off of 60% of the runtime. Yeah, so you say it's 30% because you only shaved half the time off of 60%. So who, who here has heard of Amdahl's Law? All right, not, not very many. OK, that's fine. All right, so 60% of the time of foo drops in half. But 40% of our time we spent in bar, that's still all there. So Amdahl's law basically gives us this nice little formula that says, what is the percentage of, of, of the time we're being in the part we speed up? How much time do we actually speed it up? 
we plug and chug the numbers, and that tells us what our improvement is going to be. So even though we made the foo function two times faster, the improvement is really going to be that we're only going to run 1.4 times percent faster, or 1.4 times faster, because we're not spending 100% of the time in that foo function. Right? So what Amdahl's law is useful to do is for you to say, as I look at my program, and I'm trying to figure out what are, the, what, you know, what are the high poles in the tent, what are the parts of the code that I'm spending most of my time on, and I want to speed up, you can then now start to approximate what the importance improvement you're going to get is. And at some point, it's a, you get diminishing returns, because I can optimize this piece of code that it maybe is super expensive, but I only call it once every, every hour, then it's not worth the time to speed that thing up. You want to spend time looking at the, the part that actually is exercised the most and see what the, the benefit you're getting. So Amdahl's law is a very useful thing to, to, again, to, to approximate this, uh, what the benefit you're going to get is. So what tools can you actually use to profiling other than the, the stupid pause that, on the keyboard? So the two classes of programs are uh, Valgrind and, and Perf. So these are Linux specific. I don't know what it's called in Mac or Windows. I don't care. Um, right. So, all right. But I, th I think these things exist. Like, Perf doesn't exist in the Mac, but I think Valgrind does, right? Yeah. So, um, I, there's Xcode, I think, and OSX, the, the, the Apple provides basically the, the same thing. All right. So, the two approaches are uh, to do binary instrumentation to, in the actual program as it's running, to figure out where it's actually executing the code. Another approach is actually just use the hardware counters inside the, that, the, that the CPU provides to estimate what events are occurring in different parts of the code. So we'll go through these one, one by one. So again, Valgrind is not a single program. Uh, it's actually a, a, sort of a generic framework that allows you to implement a bunch of different tools to do the, to different kinds of dynamic analysis. Uh, I don't know how many there are, but these are the three that we care about the most. Memcheck is what I think Valgrind originally started off as, is the ability to see whether you have memory leaks. Um, call grind is a way to see where you're actually being, uh, you know, what pieces of the code are being invoked the most. And then a massive is a way to track the memory usage of your program over time. So this is actually really useful for us because we're an in-memory database. We want to know what, you know, what parts of the code, you know, are we allocating the most amount of memory, right? Again, another shitty thing we did in Peloton was uh, in the case when we did B, for our BW tree, it would allocate the entire hash table to do the mapping, uh, the, the, the indirection layer you guys read about. It would allocate that entire data structure when you started, when you, immediately when you started the, the, you know, created the index, even though there wasn't anything in the index. So it used to be when you turn on Peloton, it would immediately, without putting any data into the database, it would spike up to like 130 megabytes. Right? Just the program, just, the program itself would be 130 megabytes. And see, we used Massive to figure out why the hell this was the case, and we figured out it was the BW tree. All right, so the way to use call grind uh, is from the command line, you just sort of pass in uh, this, this, these flags like this, and then you just run the function that you want. And then this will spit out a, a, a file called callgrind.out, usually with, with and then the process number. And then you can use a nice tool like cache, cache, kcache grind to actually visualize what the what the, the, the performance trace looks like. So this is what, uh, if you run the concurrent read benchmark, you'll get something like this. So along this side here, you have the cumulative time distribution for different functions. Um, and then this has a nice visualization tool to do call graph, for the call graph of what's calling what. It tells you how many times it called it, it tells you what percentage of the program time is spent in this, uh, in this part of the code. And then you can drill down these functions and actually see uh, the actual source code if you, if you have the debug symbol set up correctly. So this is a really nice tool that, that, that'll say, all right, where are you actually spending you know, the, where, where are you spending the instructions to execute source code, but it's not going to tell you anything about where you're actually spending time, right? Because this is not going to capture things like CPU cycles. This, this, this just captures instructions, right? So this is what perf is going to do for us. So perf is going to allow us to use, again, the low-level performance counters that's available in, 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 on the hardware, and it basically, it's going to do these, just like call grind, it does these samples and, and figures out uh, how many different events are being spent in different parts of the code. So the one we care about is cycles, which I think you get by default. 
Um, but you actually see the full list of like other things that thing captured. It'll capture like cache misses, branch miss predictions, and things like that, which is really useful to get like low level understanding of what the program is actually doing to do debugging, right? So basically, it just uses counters to track these events, and when the counter overflows, it just does a sample, right? So what will happen is you run perf on the program. It'll generate this, I think, perf.report file. Uh, and then you just run this perf report command, and that'll generate uh, sort of a, a trace visualization like this, right? And then again, along this side, you're seeing again the, the cumulative event distribution, and then you can look at the very top and say, well, what, where am I spending most of my time, right? So I think for the, for, for the first project, we've asked you guys to look at uh, begin transaction and commit transaction. So you now drill into these two functions and see what parts of the code Am I spending most of my time? Where, where am I spending all my cycles? Right? Instructions will tell you what instructions you're executing, but it's not going to say if you stall on a, on a, on a spin latch, right? those are cycles because you're waiting to acquire those things. Or you know, having it go fetch regions of memory will take longer cycles too. So this is why call grind won't capture those things, but perf will. So this kind of sucks to look at, uh, but I mean, this is what I, you know, I grew up on. This is what I would use. Right? You can kind of look at these are like mangled C++ uh, symbols to say like, you know, transaction manager, log commit. Like you can sort of read this, but it's not easily decipherable. I haven't figured out a way to fix this in Linux. But this is why I also love the internet because I did this lecture last semester and some guy tweeted at me and said, hey, there's this great program called Hotspot for Linux and it'll generate you nice visualizations of, of, of perf readouts. So you just load in the same perf, perf file that perf generates. Instead of using the command line tool, uh, you can get a nice visualization like this. And now you have actually more easily read uh, uh, function names and class names. Um, so you can also do things like uh, filter out regions of time during the, the execution. So the benchmark you guys are get, we're giving you has basically two phases. The first phase, you load the database. Then the second phase, you actually run the benchmark where you're doing all the reads. So you can see that here in these events. Like this is the region where we're doing all the loading, and then everything after this is where we're doing all the actual execution. So you want to filter out the this and only look at this to try to identify what the problem is, right? You can do this from the command line too. I, I just don't know how, right? The other thing it gives you also is a nice flame graphs to again, be able to drill down even in more detail of like where you're actually spending uh, spending your time, which is again, is, it's a really useful tool um, to see what's actually going on at a high level, and then you can drill down and see what's 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 happening. I don't know whether this hooks into the source code or you can see the actual instructions, but if you want to see actually what's the assembly doing as well, Perf will give you, give you this as uh, uh, a, a nice breakdown with again with the, the 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 number of events for each each like line of instruction, which is amazing. Okay, so uh, again, perf does other things, not just cycles, cache misses, uh, branch misses. You can see the full list if you do this. Um, and so here, if you want to get record a bunch of stuff like cycles and last level cache, cache misses, um, you can pass in a you know, comma separated list of all the events you want, and it'll dump that all into a single file. And then in the tool itself, you can say what you know what uh, what event you want to be organized on. Okay. All right, so there's a bunch of references. Again, I'll post this on uh, the slides online so you can get to these things. Uh, I think a bunch of these are already in the link for the for the the, the, the project. So for this project, we're having you use perf because again, most of you have not tried it. For this, for the final project, for the larger piece, you want to actually use a combination of both of these. So call grind will tell you where you're maybe doing stupid, you know, making stupid calls for things. But when you want to get to low level optimizations, of like where am I where am I having cache misses? Where is, where is my data misaligned, right? Perf is the only way to be able to figure those things out. So that's why you need to be familiar using both of them, okay? All right, next class. Keys, more keys, or how to store keys, how to do uh, something more, more about memory allocation and garbage collection, but then we'll spend most of our time talking about different data structures, the lock-free data structures, although T trees aren't lock-free or latch-free, okay? Any questions? 60 degrees, this is right? You got a bounce to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I guzzle, cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. 
Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it Careful with the bottle, baby, you can still spill it Cause ain't eyes and said, the pain I'm red You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head Take back the pack of duds You go get you some same knives and drink it to the studs Billy D is the chili cheese, sit down with the weak guys Be a man and get a can of snake pie